When I was just out of university, I took a job teaching in a, in a private secondary school. I taught French to adolescents, which was really fun. And as part of that job, I was expected to participate in sports programs. That was good for me. I think one of the reasons I was recruited was I had played two sports at university level in, 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 in the recent past. So I coached boys in those two sports for the first two trimesters. First I coached soccer, and then I coached basketball. That was good because they were sports I knew really well. Somehow in the third trimester, I ended up with the with the task, with the, with the job of coaching girls varsity softball. This was a little different for me because I didn't know much about softball. I had played the game as a child, so I, I could brush up on that. But the bigger challenge was, what did I know at age 22 about managing a group of 17 teenage girls? Not very much. So, we started off, and in spite of all my reservations, things were going really well. You know, we were building trust in each other very quickly. Uh, the girls were really working hard, and we were learning and having fun and winning most of our games, and everything was going along great. At the same time, as the weeks went on, something started to bother me. And what bothered me was the way we, at times, dealt with adversity. A simple example is the weather. We were in a place where the weather was very variable, so it could change quickly, or one day could be beautiful and the next day horrible. On the good days, everything was great. You know, we could go out and do what we wanted to do. We could do fielding practice, batting practice. The girls really liked that. That was a lot of fun. But then we had some days where we had to be out there anyway in spite of the rain and the cold, and we were learning new things. And on those days, on those days, some of the girls would start to complain about the conditions, and then things could turn quite negative. So sometimes it bothered me. Well, actually, it bothered me a lot that on those days, we, I thought we could do something much better. And I wanted to inspire a change in mindset, but I didn't really quite know how. I was 22 and still a bit finding my way and, and a bit uncertain of my role. Um, and so I didn't, I, I had this conflict inside of me. Part of me said, you know, just stick to softball, everything's going fine. But another part of me felt that it, it would be really important to, to say something about attitude. So I resolved this conflict and I decided to do it. And when I finally chose to do it, I decided to do it in the form of a story, at least a story that was inspired by one of my coaches many years before. Uh, and I remember very clearly, I can still remember it to this day, I sat the girls down, I sat the whole team down, on three rows of superimposed benches. And we did this often, by the way. We often sat on these benches. But it was usually to talk about strategy or some aspect of the game or learn a new skill. Today, it was different because it was something I was doing for the first time, talking about something that went beyond the game. So I was nervous about that, but I decided just to let myself go and speak from the heart. What I told the girls was that I thought everything was going very well. But I thought that on some days, we were reacting like front runners. By front runners, I mean, you know, people who are very good when everything's wonderful and they're running at the front of the pack. But these same people, when conditions are difficult, when the competition catches up, when they have to dig in and come from behind, they have a much harder time. And I said, you know, we want to be more than front runners. Um, front runners are only good on the, on, on, on the, on, on the very easy days. That's not what we want to be. And I told them that I thought the front runner story was a good metaphor because it applies to everything in life. For example, being part of a group. Some members of a team are only good on the easy days. And other members of the team are good on all days. And we wanted to be the kind of people who were good throughout. So, you know, I didn't know. I was talking to them about, you know, being good team members and, and being team players and supporting each other. I didn't know if this message was getting in. Because at the end, and again, I can still see them out there. I can still see them out there looking at me. They're looking at me with this, with this look that is maybe intent, maybe vacant, that only teenagers really know how to do. And, they, and, and I'm, I'm standing there thinking, you know, I wonder if this message is getting in or if they've completely tuned it out. And I really didn't know. So I went home and I was thinking, uh, 
you know, I wonder how tomorrow's practice is going to be. And I wonder how they're going to respond to all this. In the end, I didn't have to wait for the next day's practice because an unusual thing happened, and it was very unusual. Girls started to seek me out in the hallways, or they'd wait for me after class, or they'd drop notes in my letterbox, and they would say things. You know, the message was pretty unanimous, at least from the ones that were giving me feedback. They said, you know, we really appreciated that speech, or it meant a lot to me, and I think it's going to have a big impact. So I realized, you know, they really had been listening, and I thought, Maybe I'm really onto something in the way I talk to them. But again, I wasn't so sure. But in the end, it did change their behavior. They really started to support each other. And a team that was already had good results became an exceptional team and had exceptional results. And I think a lot of things really changed that day. And for me, two things happened. I never hesitated again to speak from the heart to my classes and my teams, because I realized that, that, that you can have a big impact that way. And the other thing was, I think I began to understand the impact of story in influencing a group and in uh, motivating a group's behavior. So, fast forward about 20 years from those early coaching days. It's probably exactly 20 years, but close to 20 years. I'm now doing research for my doctoral dissertation, and I'm beginning to read everything, trying to find patterns in what makes leaders effective. There's a lot of literature about this. You know? Most of it focuses on behaviors and personalities and styles. And so I started reading all these things, and a lot of it's very interesting, but the big problem that I had was one study seemed to contradict another. In other words, one study would say, you know, the narcissistic personality and the aggressive narcissist makes the most effective leader. Then I'd read another, story, uh, another study and it would say, the, you know, the soft-spoken, empathic introvert makes the, makes the best leader. So you would have these two contradictions. And like I say, it was very interesting to read all these things. But at the same time, it was frustrating. So in my frustration, I invented a little game just for myself. I started to take two people who were diametrically opposed in terms of personality, style, and behavior. And I wanted to find out if they had anything at all in common. For example, I would take Steve Jobs, the abrasive narcissist, and Nelson Mandela, the soft-spoken unifier. And I would look at the two of them and I would say, you know, is there anything at all that they might have in common? And I played this game for weeks and months and took a lot of different pairs. And finally, in the end, I came up with three things. I came up with three things that I thought, even in these very diverse pairs, they had in common. The first thing was, they have deep self-knowledge. Regardless of their personalities, regardless of their behaviors, regardless of their styles, they all had self-knowledge, they all had very clear ideas about who they are, what they stand for, what they believe, why they do things the way they do. The second thing is, they had no hesitation at all when they were in front of a group to speak from the heart about the things that they wanted to express. They expressed themselves by speaking from here. And the third thing that I found was they used their personal stories. They used personal stories from their lives to influence their worlds. And I came to call these identity stories. Okay? And I think, what exactly do I mean by identity stories? To demonstrate that, I think the best thing is to show a few examples. First example is Nelson Mandela. When journalists asked Mandela how he went from being a firebrand revolutionary in his younger years to later becoming a, a, a pacifist and a voice for unity in his mature years, how did that happen? He told stories. He told stories about the time he spent in prison and how it transformed him. He told stories about how he had time to reflect peacefully. He told stories about how he reached out to the white guards and tried to understand who they are. And he said that that experience transformed him and turned him into a new man so that when he left prison, he was completely changed. Second example is Steve Jobs. When the engineers at Apple and the designers at Apple wanted to know why Steve Jobs was so absolutely fanatical about detail, why he was so obsessed with the detail of how things were made, and they wanted to know specifically that 
You know, we're making a computer, and inside that computer, no one's ever going to look. Okay? It's a closed system. No one's ever going to see the inside. But Steve wants to make it look beautiful, even inside that no one will ever see. When they asked him about all this, he told stories. He told stories about his father, who was a master craftsman. And when Steve Jobs was young, he used to work on projects with his father. For example, they would paint a fence. And he, he said, you know, my father taught me when you're painting a fence how you do it perfectly. And then when he got to the back of the fence, he said, we're going to do the back just as beautifully as we did the front. And Steve said, you know, no one's ever going to see the back. But his father would say, even if no one sees the back, you will know that you did that job right and that you can be proud of your work and that you did the whole job. And he said, that's my vision for what we have to be at Apple. We do the whole job. My third example is meatballs. I actually put up the meatballs for two reasons. One is, my children think of Ikea as the place we go to eat meatballs. <laughs> but uh, the, the more important reason is, the founder of Ikea is Ingvar Kamprad, and if I put a picture of, of him up, maybe some of you would recognize him, but I think very few, because he was not like Nelson Mandela or Steve Jobs. He was a very private person. But he was a very remarkable person who had a huge influence on the furniture industry and on retail in general. Um, when people asked, and particularly his suppliers, asked Mr. Comprad, what is your vision for the kind of furniture you want your company to make? He told stories. He told stories about the place he came from. He comes from a place in the province of Smallland, in the south of Sweden. And it's a very rugged place, and the weather's horrible, and it's very difficult there. And he said, the people are rugged and crafty and diligent. And these people, he said, these are the people I want to make our furniture for. I want to make furniture in their image. It should be rugged. It should, it should be solid. It should last and last and last. And it should cost a little less every year and be built a little stronger every year, just like the people from my land. So, Why do these stories have such an impact on us, these identity stories? You know, I think story in general is, there, there, are, there are many reasons why story is very powerful and has such an impact on us. Let me just talk about two. I think the first reason is our lives are stories. Since our lives are stories, story becomes the natural language for people to connect with each other. Just think what happens when we meet somebody new. If you meet somebody new and you want to get to know each other, what do you do? You tell your stories. You talk about, you ask each other questions. Where did you go to school? What was your childhood like? What kind of past did you have? Why did you make the decisions you make? Why do you, why, how did you enter the career you entered? All of these things are our personal stories and they are absolutely what connects us. The second reason I think story is so impactful is there's an emotional component to story that no other type of argument, especially rational argument, could ever have. And story touches us something very, touches something very deep inside of us. And it is the only way, the only way to touch the head and the heart at the same time. And that's why it's very, it's a very good way to convince any kind of, any kind of group. Okay. So, as I was doing all this, and as, as I got around to uh, finally, publishing my, my doctoral thesis, I was also coaching CEOs and entrepreneurs in uh, trying to help them find their, their identity stories and tell their identity stories. Okay? And at the same time, I was looking back at my own life. I've always been a reflective person, but I think my doctoral research made me even more reflective. So I'm thinking back and I'm making a connection between the sports coach from from in my early 20s and, and the researcher that was, that was studying leadership. And one of the things I realized is we all live life moving forward, but we can only understand it looking backwards. So I made this connection from my past and the connection made me think, you know, what I'm doing with CEOs and what I'm doing with entrepreneurs, it can work anywhere, it can work in any context. You could even be a 22-year-old sports coach who found it kind of by accident, 
that could even happen because I know, because it happened to me. So I, I made that connection and it changed my approach. It changed my approach to things. And not that I stopped working with CEOs and interviewing CEOs and coaching entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I really found that this can work for anyone. So why do I say that it can work for anyone? I say it can work for anyone. If you th let's think back to the three examples, the three examples that I used. Nelson Mandela told us about an event in his life, uh, the experience of going to prison. Steve Jobs told us about an influential person in his life that happened to be his father. Okay. And Ingvar Kamprad told us about an environment that really shaped him into who he is. Okay. So think about those three things. People, events, environments. We all have those elements in our lives. We all have people, events, sometimes decisions we made, but certainly environments that have shaped us into the person that we are. We all have these things, and we all have stories to tell about them. So our identity stories are already there, okay? So um, as I did this, um, I became, yeah, for, I, I started working with all kinds of different people. And for many years now, for a number of years, I've been working with not only CEOs and not only uh, entrepreneurs, I've worked now with volunteer organizations, with student organizations, telling their stories. I've worked with musicians. I've worked with scientists who are branching out into the world of business. This, I've seen this in so many contexts, and I know that it works. And it even, you know, some of the events that I've seen, I think are, I'm humbled by them because people have done amazing things by using this kind of thing. One, I'm thinking of one, uh, uh, a French volunteer who went off with a humanitarian organization to transform a medical clinic in Bolivia and did a very good job with that. Right now, I'm working with somebody called Yevgeny. Yevgeny is, uh, he works for General Electric and he's in Germany. And his project right now is he's doing a total factory restructuring in a group of factories. I'm not even sure how many, but he's restructuring, uh, and I shouldn't say he's restructuring. He's part of a team that's restructuring. And doing the restructuring of factories with all it implies. In other words, some of these people, it's a great time of uncertainty and insecurity. Some of the people may lose their jobs. Some of the people think they might lose their jobs. Some of the people are just not, they might be redeployed to another place. They're just not sure what the future's going to bring. And Yevgeny, what he has done that I find really remarkable is he's been able to motivate people to join in this team. And he motivates people, how does he do that? He tells his stories, he tells his stories of identity. And these are people that he, he, mostly people that he has no authority over. He just motivates them and he motivates them by telling his stories. He remembers, and this situation reminds him of, when he was a young adult, when he was an adolescent in the Soviet Union, and when the Berlin Wall fell, and the impact that that had on his family, and that it put his family into totally uncharted territory. He uses stories from all this Soviet experience to really uh, motivate the people around him as they wade through this very difficult time. Yevgeny is just one example of many. It's just one example of, that shows that we can do this in, in any kind of context, in, in any venue, and I'm really more and more convinced of that. So, in the end, I think I've made three discoveries. Maybe more, but <laughs> I think three. The first is, I think, you know, we all have more influence in our worlds than we believe. That's one of my deepest convictions. The second thing is we all have stories of identity inside of us. Identity stories exist in all of us. We just have to think about them and learn to use them. And the third thing is connect the first two points because the third one flows out of the first two. You can use these stories of identity to have more influence in your world, no matter what your world is. Okay? So when I say this to people, I get some dose of skepticism. I, I've done it for so long that I know it works. But people still say to me, you know, I don't have anything 
unusual in my past. I don't have any extraordinary experience. I don't have any gift. I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm not even a good storyteller. How can I do this? And I say, my response to that, and it's my only response, it's one of my deepest convictions after everything that I've, that, uh, after my journey. My deepest conviction is this, everybody, everybody in any context, everybody in this audience, everybody has a usable past. Some people just learn to use theirs better. <laughs>